Well, good evening, everyone. Faith Love Fellowship Church, Pastor Nick Fontana here. A pleasure coming to you, gathering uh, those that are in the church. You are welcome, and we are so glad to have you. Those that are watching us on Facebook Live and later on on uh, demand on YouTube, and uh, we, we are so thankful that you joined us from all over the world. Uh, if you would, maybe drop a, a quick note to uh, let us know you're watching. So it encourages us to know that we're reaching people, amen, outside of our own four walls and uh, that you're being blessed by the services, okay? We encourage you to get your Bible, get your notebook, and we are in chapter 10 of the book of Hebrews. Uh, we endeavor to do a line upon line study so we can kind of get the most out of each of these uh Books as we study throughout the Word of God in, in the New Testament, and uh, we'll just continue right on down until we get to the end of Revelation, and then we'll see where the Lord takes us. We'll go back and start all over again. Amen. Uh, we are always seeing new things. The Spirit of God is always bringing fresh wisdom and revelation to the Word of God. The Word of God never changes, just sometimes where you're at in your life. Uh, it, you, you have ears to hear, amen? And uh, and you might see things that you may never have seen before. Uh, I, I know myself that there are times where uh, I can just take certain things for granted, uh, wildlife, for instance, and, and uh, you don't notice the different color variations sometimes, and you say, well, you know, I never noticed that before. And, and so uh, it's amazing to see how as we grow and as we um, continue in our walk with the Lord, how we're able to see a little clearer all the time, amen, and uh, bring bring things. So the Word of God is always fresh. It's always new. It's always, it's always relevant. Glory to God. Timely and and wonderful. So uh, we're in the book of Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, of course, have your notebook, write down what the Spirit of God says to you. Don't trust your memory only. It's very important um, because he's trying to prepare you for what's coming. Uh, it could be a week down the road, six months down the road, a year down the road. So you want to be able to, you want to have it. You want to get a hold of it. Amen. Uh, hallelujah. The Bible talks about it. It's itself. And the Jesus is the word of God. This is more to be desired than gold. Yet than much fine gold, either sweeter also than a honeycomb. Amen? So let's pray together and let's begin. Father, we love you. We thank you for this and every opportunity that we have to be together with you around your word, with your people. Brothers and sisters of light, precious faith, we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are our teacher, our guide, that you bring revelation, understanding of the word of God, of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, and, and revelation of our Heavenly Father, and uh, draw us closer to you so that we might uh, hear what you're saying and, and see what you're trying to show us. Uh, we uh, pray that we would be willing and obedient to take the things that we learn and put them to practice in our lives. Thank you for the grace upon our life, the strength to do all that you require us to do. We praise you, bless you. May Jesus receive all the honor and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So uh, we were talking about last week, we're talking about how Jesus, uh, with his own blood, amen, uh, poured out. Uh, let's see. Did we, did we finish chapter 9? Let's see. Let's see. Yeah. I'll back up just a little bit because I don't remember finishing chapter 9. So I'll just back up a little bit and we'll just go on from there. Ah, amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, anyway, he, it talked about how, that's true, there it is. It talked about that in, the, in heaven there is a tabernacle. Amen. And that God gave direction to the people of Israel to build a tabernacle based on the pattern of the one in heaven. And, uh, and it talked about how he uh, ordained priests to be um, those who would give atonement for the people, but every single priest had to first uh, give atonement for himself because every one of them were, were sinners, amen? And uh, the Bible says there is none perfect, not, no, not one. So uh, there was no priest that, that existed that could not uh, go in first cover for himself and his family and then for the nation of Israel. But then it likens us in verse 11, chapter 9, verse 11, but Jesus 
has become such a high priest, amen, and by a greater, more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, that he became that great and wonderful high priest that he, he doesn't need to bring a sacrifice of blood for himself because he's sinless. So he's in a category completely and absolutely by himself. Amen. He, he's such a high priest that he didn't have to come with blood to cover his own sin because he was and is and always was and always will be sinless. So he was a perfect lamb and he was able to, a perfect high priest to, to bring atonement to the people. Hallelujah. And what the blood of bulls and goats could not do in that they were temporary, the blood of Jesus, which is eternal, is a complete sacrifice. Therefore, there is no more need for uh, the blood of bulls and goats or any other sacrifice because the greater one has come. The lamb has come. And, and so God is no longer pleased with the sacrifice of bulls and goats. And that whole system, that whole way of worship has been done away with because the Lord Jesus has come. Amen. And God's only requirement for mankind is worship the Son. Acknowledge Him and, and, and place all of your trust and your confidence in Him. So, amen. And, uh, and so it goes on, it says here, neither by, verse 12, neither by the blood of bulls and goats, but uh, by his own blood he entered into once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Eternal redemption. Amen. That's forever and ever and ever and ever. Praise God forever. Amen. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, offer himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Amen. And you need to focus on those expressions. When, when the word of God says things like that, how much more? Amen. You, you need to say it that way. You need to read it that way. You need to see it that way. How much more? Hallelujah. He says, in all things you are more than conquerors. Praise God. And you need to see that. You need to focus on that. Glory to God. You're not just a conqueror. You're not just a get buyer. You're, you're not just make it through by the skin of your teeth. You're a conqueror. But not only that, you're more than a conqueror. Glory to God. Yes. Because it's through him. Amen. And he is the almighty conqueror. Praise God. And because you're in him, you are more than a conqueror. Praise the Lord forever. Glory to God. So, amen. So he goes on and he says here, um, verse 15, and for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgression that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. So the person's will, you know, the last will and testament, does not go into effect until the person passes away. As long as a person is still alive, they can have a, a last will and testament. You can have a copy of it. You can be the one who inherits. But while they're still alive, it's not enacted. It is not until they pass. And so this marvelous New Testament, amen, uh, in his blood, it became active when he, when he went to the cross and surrendered his life, amen? And though he rose from the dead and he ascended into heaven and seated at the right hand of God and will live forevermore, glory to God, and we who have called upon his name will live forever with him, praise God forever, amen? His will or his, his testament went into effect when he died. Hallelujah. So when Jesus died, he said, it is finished. Now everything that he had desired for us to have becomes our possession. By his stripes, ye are healed. Ye were healed. We are healed because of the blood of Jesus. It's already in our possession. It's not, we're not waiting. What is the proof? His death. Amen. All of the New Testament your, your sins forgiven, your sickness and disease healed, your poverty, amen, abolished, the, 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 the devil's authority over your life broken forever, amen, amen. It all happened when Jesus laid his life down. And when he rose again, amen, now he watches over his word to perform it. If you'll believe it, he watches over it to perform it in your life. In other words, you stand on the promise that I obtained by my death 
and I'll make sure that it comes to pass because I was dead, but I'm alive forevermore. Amen. Praise God, right? So uh, it continues on down and it says here, for verse, verse 16, chapter 9, 16, for where a testament is, there must also of necessity, has to be this way, the death of the testator, for a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is no sh of no strength at all while the testator lives. That's reasonable. Whereupon, neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Now that was a powerful testament. We call that the Old Testament. All right. Now, it, it really, we shouldn't say old and new in a manner of speaking, because though it was it was old, it, it just sometimes gives the it gives the impression that it somehow lost its strength, somehow it lost its its relevance. But no, Jesus, as I told you, when he met the woman, he said, "Ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, be loosed of this infirmity?" Healing from a devastating disease was covered under the First Testament. So in a way, you can say the First Testament and the Second Testament. Amen? Uh, we call it the Old Testament and the New Testament because we want to separate the two that the new is better. But the first one was awesome. Amen? The old one was awesome as they were bitten by the snake and they were dying from this poison that they brought on themselves. God in his mercy told his, his man to raise up a, a serpent on a pole and all who would look upon that serpent on a pole would be healed. Even if the serpent had bitten them and the poison was in their bloodstream, if they would look upon that serpent on a pole in faith, they would be healed. Yeah. And then we're told that that was a type and a shadow of the Lord Jesus on the cross. Amen? That he became the curse. What does a serpent represent? The curse. And the curse was nailed to the cross, which brought freedom to those who would believe. Well, Jesus became sin, became sickness, all sickness, became disease, became poverty, became lack, became everything that we had to offer. Amen? And by his death, burial, and resurrection, everything he has, everything he is, becomes ours. Amen. And that's a fact. That's not going to happen. That doesn't happen if you, if you, you know, are, 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 are uh, you know, strong enough or, or, or smart enough. The only, the only requirement is if you believe it. If you believe it. And then act like it. Act like the word of God is true. Amen? Because it is. The Word of God is true, truer than anything. Truer than anything you could see, feel, hear, touch, smell. It's more real. Amen? The spirit world is more real than the natural world. Because the natural world is temporary or temporal and it's subject to change. And it changes all the time. Just take a look. Temperatures drop. Sky is, is moving. I saw the three planets lined up the other night, and an hour later, the earth is revolving, things are moving. Nothing is the same, but the Word of God is eternal, and the Lord Jesus is eternal. And He says, Jesus Christ the same, yesterday, today, and forever. Amen? The Word of God is eternal. Praise God forever. And so, there's more real than the natural. It's more real than that which is temporary, because you can count on the eternal can't necessarily count on the temporal. Amen? Can't count on that which is that which is of this earth. But you can count on, on heaven. You can count on God. Right. You can count on Jesus. You can count on the Holy Spirit. You can count on it being the way God said it's going to be. If God said it, that settles it. Now it's, it's down to do you believe it or not? Amen? And the Word of God says, whose report are you going to believe? What you see? The earth? The temporal? things subject to change or are you going to believe the one who is eternal who is not going to change who is perfect in all of his ways amen and who adores you and has only your good and in store praise god so uh notice i you know i love that 
And it says here, moreover, verse 21, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood is no remission. So I got to say it again. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So anybody who would say to you that somehow they have the authority to forgive your sins apart from the shedding of blood are lying to you. Now God had originally set up bulls and goats and turtle doves and all of those things. Not because he desired blood, it's because he is the one who, who understood that without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. Sin is so horrible and so, so uh, putrid and so revolting against the pure and holy God that he had to come up with a way, though it is seemingly as revolting and distasteful, it's better that an animal's blood is shed than the human's blood is shed. So it was an act of, of, of mercy. God is creator. God loves his creation. God loves, it says his eye is on the sparrow. Amen? He, ta he cares for the sparrows. He cares for, cares for the birds. And you know, if, if any animal dies, God is saddened by it because he's life and life eternal. Are you with me? But he was willing to allow an animal to be sacrificed so that a man or a woman would not have to be until he can bring his son on the scene, then his son would become the absolute eternal and final sacrifice that was required. And all who would accept the son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that blood would now cover them and their families. And it is not a temporary atonement. It is a eternal atonement. Right. Praise God. And God now has done away with animal sacrifice. It never was part of his plan. But, you know, backing up, Adam and Eve eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was never his plan. He told them not to do it. He forbid them from doing it. Why? Because he never wanted to. I've told you before, you've heard it. He didn't want them to know and understand evil. It was never God's will, never will be his will for his children to know fear, anxiety, worry, dread, hatred, darkness, uh, anger, frustration, bitterness, jealousy, rage, and the list goes on and on. He was trying to protect his children. And he says, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The only knowledge you need is the knowledge of me. Because I am good through and through. Trust me. Thank you, Jesus. Believe me. Take me at my word. Please. Don't, I don't want you to have the knowledge of evil. But, but as soon as they sinned, as soon as they broke covenant, so to speak, with Almighty God, God spoke salvation. Right in that place of devastating void, God prophesied that his son was going to come and be the savior of the world. And until the stage can be set when Jesus could come, because it says in the fullness of time, God, amen, made a place. He, he found a perfect opportunity in time and history and place, and then he brought his son through the Virgin Mary, amen? But before that, he needed a way that people could be forgiven. And so he set a pattern back in the garden and he slew an animal and he covered them in the blood and in the animal skin. And it covered their nakedness, it covered their shame, it covered their sin. Thank you, Jesus. But it never was his plan, never was his will. They were naked but they were not ashamed in the beginning. Uh -huh. God didn't want them to experience shame. He doesn't want, think about it, my brothers and sisters. If God didn't want Adam and Eve to experience shame and fear and dread and anger and frustration and murder, which later came on right even their, their son, murdered his brother, right? If he didn't want it then, why can we possibly think that he wants it now? 
He doesn't want it now. He doesn't want you to ever experience shame or guilt or fear or anxiety. That's why he says, come unto me. Come on, come on to me, all you who are heavy laden, all you who are burdened, all you who are tempted, all you who are struggling. I'll give you rest. I'll give you peace. Amen? Because how many know when he, when Adam and Eve sinned, God didn't abandon them. He called them to himself. And I'm not here to give you a history lesson, but he had to banish them from the garden from that point on. Because there was another tree in the garden called the tree of life. And he knew if they eat of that tree in a fallen state, they will live forever in a fallen state. So I've got to protect them from eating that and staying the way they are so they must be removed from the garden. But then in the fullness of time, God prepared his son, who is both the sacrificed lamb and the tree of life. And all who would receive him could be forgiven and receive eternal life. Amen? But not in a fallen state, in a restored, redeemed, redeemed resurrected state. Amen? No longer aliens from the covenant, but partakers of the covenant. Amen. No longer servants and slaves, but sons and daughters of Almighty God. Now it's okay to eat of the tree of life. And every time we partake of the word of God, we're, we're partaking of life. And every time we, we pray and we sing praises to God and we, we spend time in his presence telling him how much we love him and appreciate him, we're, we're eating of the tree of life. Amen? Hallelujah. So uh, let's continue. It's good, isn't it? So It's so very wonderful. So then it goes on, and it's so very important. Verse 22, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. If there was necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly sacrifices themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true. Amen? But into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. It's interesting terminology that King James uses, King James uses doesn't it? It says here, for Christ is not entered, verse 24, into the holy place made with hands, which are the figures of the true. In other words, they're just a imitation of the reality. And the reality is the spirit, in the spirit. The tabernacle not made with hands, amen, in the presence of God. That's the more real tabernacle than the tabernacles made with hands that we see. This building and other buildings, even though they're dedicated to God and to the worship of God, amen, they are made with hands and, and they yes, thank God for them, but they're temporary. But they're in the image of, of, of a place that is before God. That is the real, that's the real. Are you listening? There was an artist, some of you know, um, some of the artists that are on television. Bob Ross, very famous, right? And some others that are there. And I remember watching many of them. There was one that I liked very much. I don't remember his name. I have to Google it and find it. But he used to use knives to make trees. Knives kind of had an angle and he would had a heavy accent and he would make trees and they just slap. And then the next thing, smear paint over. And I'm like, wow. But whenever he was painting, his eyes were overlooking at something else. And, and what he was actually looking at was the original that he had painted. And so what he's doing now is he's copying the original. He made that one, but now he's trying to show us how he made that one on a fresh canvas, but he's looking and is remembering, that's the true one, that's the real one, that's the first one. Now I'm making a copy of it. And, and, it was, and it's amazing, and it was done, he would sign it, because he's the artist, and he's the, he's the one who created this one. But you know, truthfully, really truthfully, no two works of art, even by this, even if they're identical, if they're handmade, they're, they're not going to be exactly the same. 
So God gave direction to his people of how to build what he wanted. And he told them how thick the, the, the material and, 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 the, and all the other parts and, and the idea, because he is looking at the original. And he's describing to them what he wanted them to do. And when they were complete, I want you to know what they had created was not identical to the one in heaven, but it was satisfactory to God. And so God would manifest his presence there. Amen. And the people could commune with God there. And God saying it is it is as close as we could humanly possible to what I have before me in heaven. And so you understand, and that is the mercy of God. But there is a real, there's one that's more true than the one that we have. There, you know, I heard this, I don't know, somebody maybe can correct me, but I know people who uh, work with money all the time, and they don't practice with counterfeit bills. They become so familiar with the real bill that if a counterfeit comes between their fingers, they identify it immediately. And that's the idea why, because the real ones are, are very similar in appearance and feel and everything, same paper or as the original. How many of there's a mint? There's a mint. They start with one. They make a press. They, they, they design it. They put the president. They put the writing. And then they start the process of, of making more. But there's one. The same thing with coins. There are certain coins that are perfectly mint that have never seen, you know, a person's hand touch them. They were created and they were, because those are proofs. At a wedding, many times, the photographer takes pictures and you get proofs. And after you decide, I like the proofs, who usually just goes to the bride and the groom who paid for it. Then he says, if anybody else, I can make copies of the proofs for them. But the proofs you get to keep. Miss Karen and I have our proofs in a, uh, in a binder and uh, beautiful and precious to us. Amen. Hallelujah. And so very much the same way. Uh, I, I love the wording here. It says here, uh, which are figures of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. Praise God. Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entered into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Amen? So he came the first time to be a sacrificed lamb, but he's coming the second time as a conquering king to draw unto himself all that have called upon his name in faith. Praise God. He says, as it is appointed unto men once to die, every man and woman will die. And after this, the judgment. Stand before God and give account. I don't have time to teach it. Maybe we'll do it another time. We'll go into more detail about it. To the Christian, it's what did you do with Jesus? To the unsaved, it is what did you do with Jesus? Are you listening? Mm -hmm. To the unsaved, it's Jesus is the only way. How did you, that, you allow that to influence your life? And many of them will say, I didn't let it. I didn't, I didn't want it. No one will be able to say I never heard because God's going to make sure that everybody is given opportunity to hear over and over and over and over. There are some that are raised in, in, in God. Grandmothers and grandfathers and mothers and fathers and somewhere they walked away and, and uh, they, they know better. But then the other question to Christians is, what did you do with my son? In other words, you had him. You had his word. You had the spirit of God. 
You have the gift of praying in tongues. You have the anointing in your life. What, what did you do with it? Amen? Because he said, he told the brothers Christians, he said, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. Lay hands on the sick, they'll recover, cast out devils, freely receive, freely give. So he's going to ask, what did you do with that? So really, it's, just, it's the same question, but coming from two different sides. Hallelujah. And depending on how we answer that, the Bible says will we receive rewards for, for how well we, we carried Jesus out into the world. How, how well we lived Jesus in, pe in before people. And, and to those that, uh, you know, uh, were successful and endured persecution, hardship, he says you receive a crown of life and crowns. But to those who refuse and, and don't accept, and I'm talking about for those who are not saved, who refuse to accept Jesus, they, they, will, they will miss everything. And, uh, and uh, because they chose, not because God uh, banishes every, anyone to hell. It's not God's will that any perish, but all come to salvation in Jesus Christ. But there are going to be those who just refuse, and uh, they're going to go to hell. So my brothers and sisters, we Christians need to pray, and we need to live for Jesus, and we need to try to reach as many people as we can before that time comes. Because sometimes what's standing between a person who doesn't know Jesus and one who does is somebody like you and me praying for them, shining our lights before them, talking to them, amen? Hallelujah, befriending them. My uh, experience for the years that I have been involved in this is it all starts with a relationship. So it's wonderful to, to get in a place where you can start a relationship and begin to talk to somebody and they'll, they'll begin to see there's something about you, there's something different about your life. They start asking questions and then you can just help them and share with them and, and, and bless them. Amen? Praise God forever. Um, of course, there's always the opportunity of preaching to the masses too, because those that have never had an opportunity here, thank God for mass evangelism and, and, and things like that. It's, it's, it's awesome. It's all awesome. Amen. We're, we're co-laborers co together with the Lord for the uh, building of the kingdom of God and the ransacking of the kingdom of darkness. So anyway, it continues on and let's finish up this chapter here. Um, let's see. Uh, okay. Let me see. There we go. All right. As it is appointed, verse 27, unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. And unto them, and unto them that look for him, shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So it's to those who are looking for him. To those that are believing and trusting and living for God, Amen. Those are the ones that will that he, they will see him when he returns. Chapter ten: For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never, with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually, make the comers thereunto perfect. For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things. See, Jesus is the thing to come. Jesus is the perfection. He's the good thing. Amen? But God was very kind. We just read it on Sunday, the blessings of Deuteronomy. God wanted to bless his people so much. He said, if you will hearken diligently unto my word and obey what I tell you, these blessings will come upon you. And they are amazing blessings and wonderful and cover every area of our lives. Amen. Hallelujah. But they were only a shadow of the good things to come because in Christ, in Jesus, is the fullness. Amen. He's the fullness of joy. He's the fullness of peace. He's the fullness of health and healing. He's the fullness of salvation. He is eternal life. Amen. He is love personified. He is peace personified. Are you with me? So the law was offering by obedience to the word of God, good things, great things, amazing things. But Jesus, when he came, he is offering himself. 
which is everything good. Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights with whom there's not a shadow of turning. So if, it, if it's a good gift, Jesus makes it available to you and to me. Amen? Can you think of some good gifts? How about no more headaches? That's a good gift, isn't it? No more heartache. It's a good gift. No more regret. No more remorse. No more fear. No more, no more bitterness. No more resentment. No more despair. No more discouragement. No more depression. How many of those are good things? Can you imagine them? You got to imagine them before you can walk in them, my brothers and sisters. You got to say, yes, Lord, I believe that. I receive that from your hand. Uh, my days of headaches are over. My days of, of, of heartache are over. And, and the list goes on and on. You with me? Hallelujah. So let's continue just a little more. My time will get away from me. Amen. Verse 2. For then would they not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshippers once purged should have no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh, that's Jesus, into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offerings thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. I told you the sacrifice of the bulls and goats was never part of God's plan. But he had to allow it so that we could have hope. But once he sent his son, there was no more need because Jesus paid it all. Amen? Amen. Amen? In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. See, I'm not making up, my brothers and sisters, right here. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, the Lord speaking, lo, I come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me to do thy will, O God. So the whole context of the whole Bible from beginning to end is Jesus, is God's way of forgiveness and how to obtain eternal life. It, it's not intended to cover every base, you know. Well, where, does the Bible talk about dinosaurs? Does the, the Bible talk about, you know, what happened before? And, and, and what does the Bible talk? The purpose of the Bible is to show us that we are in need of a Savior and that God has sent a Savior and what it means to us who receive it and what it means to those who refuse. It's all there is. Well, there's an awful lot of pages, uh, Pastor Nick, for, for that. But that's all. That, that's what it's all in, in, a, in a nutshell, what it is. The need of mankind for a Savior and God's kindness in sending His Son and what it means to those who believe. But God is also going to tell the truth and what it means to those who refuse to believe. And then the hope is Believe on the Son and live. Amen? Believe on the Son and live. Believe on the Son and live. Praise God. Amen? Hallelujah. Amen. Then said I, it says in verse 6, In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, sacrifice and offerings and burnt offerings and offering for sin, thou wouldest not, neither hast pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. You getting it? You seeing it? Twice it was mentioned. First it said, In burnt offerings and sacrifices of sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Can you imagine? 
Every family was responsible to bring a sacrifice. Depending on how much you could afford, a bull, a goat, turtle doves. They had to bring it to the temple. The priests were slitting throats, bloods going everywhere, and then burning it, and the stench, and the fat, and all the rest of it. And you think that somehow, you know, because pagans required that. Pagan gods, demonic gods, required the shedding of blood. But they weren't requiring it to save the people, they were required because they are bloodthirsty and they are disgusting and revolting. And they're trying to control the people with fear. And so that's where that came from. God wasn't trying to control the people. He took no pleasure in it at all. The flies and the, and the, and the stench and all the rest of it. But it was the only way that the people could be forgiven for a year. Because... Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. But he didn't, never took pleasure in it. And then in the second verse, it says here, above all, in verse 8, when he said, sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offerings for sin, thou wouldest not. God didn't want it that way in the first place. Are you listening? Thou wouldest not, neither hath pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. But it had to be that way for a period of time. He took no pleasure in it, and he never wanted it to exist in the first place. But man made their choice when they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And when we sin, when we, when we do things that we, that we know are, right, are wrong, and we choose to do them anyhow, I've heard people say, I've been doing this a long time, people say, well, just because Adam and Eve sinned, why am I held accountable for their sin? Well, if you'd be honest with yourself, you'll realize, as the Bible says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Amen? When the mark is absolute perfection, we've all sinned. And in a matter of speaking, we've all disobeyed God. That's what it means. And therefore, we are all deserving of punishment and judgment. That's the truth. We're all deserving of hell. When the, when, the, when the bullseye is perfection and you fall short, you deserve hell. You deserve punishment. But God so loved the world. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever will believe in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen? Hallelujah. Yeah. I hope it clarifies some things for you, my brothers and sisters. Then verse 9, he says, Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. What did Jesus say in the garden? Not my will, but thy will be done. First, he said, if there's a way that this cup might pass for me. In other words, that I wouldn't have to go through with it this way. If there's another way, please. Because he knew what, it was, what he was about to endure. And what was going to crush him more than the, than the pain of the whipping post and the crown of thorns and the mocking of the soldiers and tearing out his beard and, and parading him through the city and stripping him naked and bare. And, and all that he endured was having his father turn his face from him. He cried out so, so horrifically, Father, why? Amen? Why hast thou forsaken me? Why? Because he became sin. He became the sin of all the world. Sin, sickness, disease, the curse of the law was laid upon him so that by his stripes we are healed, spirit, soul, body forever. Amen? Glory to God. Thank you, Lord, is right. So then it continues. It says, For he said, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Who's he talking about? You and me. 
all who have placed our trust in Jesus, all who call him Savior and Lord. It transcends denominations, it transcends nationalities, it transcends everything that mankind uses to separate us. And Jesus came for a body, amen. He came to unite all people in himself. And so it doesn't matter what color you are, it doesn't matter you know, what nationality you are, what language you speak, if you call Jesus Savior and Lord, we are brothers and we are sisters, Amen. Amen. And we are one in the body of Christ. And God wills that all men be saved. That's his will. But the only way that's going to happen, and he's the one who came up with it, is the body of Christ mobilizes, lives godly, and shares the good news, the good things of God, shares our testimony, what God means to me, how he changed my life. Amen. I once was sick, but now I'm healed. I once was poor, but now I'm blessed. I once was without, but now I have all. I once was a, a creature of, of darkness, but now I'm a son, a daughter of the light. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. That's your testimony, my brothers and sisters. Thank you, Lord. And there are people out there that need to hear your testimony. They need to not only see, but they need to taste it. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Are you listening? Praise God. So anyway, let's continue just a little more. Our time has gotten away from us for tonight. And I realize that I'm probably giving you a lot. Amen. But we're just, uh, you can go back and read again. And the Holy Spirit will bring some of the things we talked about back to remembrance. But because he's wonderful and we can't by any means cover it all, he's going to show you some new things, some things that we didn't talk about. Amen. Hallelujah. So when you get a few moments, go back and read from Hebrews chapter 9 about verse 11 to wherever we leave off tonight. It can only bless you. Amen. Amen. Anyway, that's just, uh, we'll go to verse 18. So notice it says here from henceforth, verse 13, expecting, he's expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified, whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Hallelujah. Amen. Jesus paid it all. Thank you, Jesus. And if you accept Jesus, you've received forgiveness, mercy, grace, which is strength to do all that you need to do, kindness, love, amen, mm -hmm. salvation, which is fivefold at least, not only means salvation to be saved, but to be healed and preserved and protected and, and delivered, amen? Mm -hmm. it, it all belongs to you. So walk in the light of all of it and live it before people so that they too might taste and see that the Lord is good and call upon his name for themselves and be saved. Amen. Father, we return as always to give you thanks and praise for the good word of God. Amen. We are so grateful. We thank you for these assembled in the church and uh, thank you for their passion and their, their hunger for your word and uh, their willingness to take this word and to take it out into the world around them. We pray and bless you for those that tuned in on Facebook Live and later on on Facebook and on YouTube. Thank you, Lord, that the word of God just continues to expand, continues to go into the, into the world, into the lives of, of people, uh, those that have ears to hear and eyes to see are, are receiving this word and it's transforming their lives. And Lord, we thank you for the work of the Holy Spirit. As always, we praise you, we bless you, we thank you in the name of Jesus. As we return to our homes, individual homes, Lord, we pray for traveling mercies. We pray and bless. thank you that our homes are blessed, that our sleep tonight will be sweet and very restorative. And Lord, we thank you till we come again. We bless the name of Jesus. And thank you always in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, everybody. Thank you so very much. We appreciate you. We'll see you next time. Sunday morning, 10 o'clock. God bless you.